Okay, in this tutorial, I want to take a look at the big picture. So far, we've been concentrating on individual bills and just getting certain chunks of our base sorted. In this one, I want to concentrate on where we're actually going, the actual plan, infinite sustainability. You want to hit a point where you don't have to worry about water, food, and power. You want all three of those things to be effectively infinite. And the only way to do that is with certain wells and geysers that are scattered around the map. Now, when this game starts, you are basically made four or five promises. The first promise is you you will end up with cool, two cool steam vents. You're going to get two cool steam vents. That's a guarantee. Uh, the next guarantee is you will get one oil well. You're going to get at least one. You can get up to three, but you're guaranteed one of them. Uh, you are guaranteed one natural gas geyser. Hasn't actually shown up on this map yet. It's probably closer to space. Um, so that's four promises. And the fifth one is you have a 50-50 chance of getting a second natural gas geyser or a chlorine vent, one or the other. Now, based on those, I've been designing this entire playthrough to get to a point of perfect sustainability, only banking on those. That's it. You can get volcanoes. You can get more water sources, slush geysers, all sorts of things. There are many things you can get, but none of them are guaranteed. You are only guaranteed one oil well, two cool steam vents, a natural gas geyser, and possibly chlorine, a 50-50, a second natural gas, or a chlorine vent. Now, how do we hit perfect sustainability with just those things? Well, this is a, an oil boiler. I'm going to do a tutorial on this later. It's not really important. All it does is it turns crude oil into petroleum at a one-to-one -one ratio. And this is hugely important because it allows us to extract more raw resources from it. It doubles, it effectively doubles the power. So what we're going to do is put water into an, an oil well, one kilo of water per second, and it emits 3.3 kilos of crude oil. That crude oil we're going to put through a petroleum boiler and then feed into our petroleum generators. Those petroleum generators are going to kick out 750 grams of polluted water. Without a, without an oil boiler, this wouldn't be sustainable. But with the oil boiler, this means that for every kilo of water we put into this oil well, we will get 1.2 kilos of polluted water back at the bottom of our power plant. We can then sieve that polluted water, turn it into clean water, and put a kilo of it back into the oil well. And then the whole system starts again, going round and round, effectively generating 3.3 kilowatts of power indefinitely for the entire game, for as long as we have filtration medium for the sieves. The filtration medium we can we can substitute in, when the sand runs out, we can substitute in regolith from space. There's ways to farm that, that's much later though. But additionally, on top of this, not only does it generate power, this actually solves food problems as well. The second byproduct of a petroleum generator is a huge amount of carbon dioxide, 500 grams a second. We take all this crude oil and burn it in a petroleum generator. The amount of carbon dioxide that will be kicked out will feed just about 25 slicksters, maybe, uh, maybe a fraction under 25. So we can support 24 slicksters easily, which will actually give us even more crude oil. But that's just a that's actually a byproduct. It's not the purpose of slicksters. The slicksters basically, in this instance, count as a food source. Now, as I covered earlier, these things are basically direct, are basically hatches in most respects. They have the exact same lifespan, the exact same reproduction rate, exact same egg drop ratio, exact same eggshell size, egg yolk, everything. It's only their diet that differs, really. And we can pump in the carbon dioxide, reducing duplicate overhead. Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. Most importantly, it's just 24 slicksters will allow us to support about 11 to 12 duplicates on omelets. All from one oil well. So one oil well is going to be able to allow us to support 11 duplicates and generate 3.3 kilowatts of power indefinitely. And the third leg of sustainability is oxygen. And for that, we're going to need water for our electrolyzer setup. And that's where the cool steam vents come in. Now, I ran this through the calculator online and this generates one kilo of water per second, which is enough to support one or 8.8 .8 duplicates. I've got a second vent I've tapped over here. I'll cover this in another tutorial as well. It's a different design. And this one is going to generate 1.5 kilos of water. That's enough water. That's 2.5 kilos of water per second, which is enough to support about 20 duplicates. 
In fact, I also have a second oil well over here, so we, we could definitely run a rather large base, even with this minimalist setup. But what I want to concentrate on here is, assuming you want to get one oil well and a couple of steam vents, you should still be able to easily support nine duplicates. It is possible to roll short on the steam vents and get hurt for that. There's there's no way around that. It's it's random numbers. There's no real way you can get, get around it. However, this will generate an extra 0.2 kilos of water a second, so we can help use that to help supplement our water supply. Supporting nine duplicates indefinitely should be attainable unless you get really, really unlucky. Normally I'd play 12, but I'm trying to do this from the point of just sheer safety. Now, I want to go back over where we're going, at, well, that's much where we're going, how we got here. All the decisions we made along the way, all the choices, all the builds we used, some of them seemed non-standard, but they all had a purpose and a reason. They were all there to get you to this point as safely as possible. No, safe. In the most map-resistant way possible. No matter how bad your map start is, it should be almost impossible. Unless you get an absolutely horrendous map start, you should be able to get to this point of perfect sustainability. No matter how bad the numbers roll against you. One quick note on perfect sustainability. There are multiple ways to do it. There, there's more than one way to skin a cat, as they say. Now, uh, one thing I'm going to do is ignore some of the things that are classified as not exploited. This is a single player game. There's no such thing really as exploits in a single player game. Just things that could potentially be patched out or don't really follow, or follow the developer's intent and could potentially be nerfed or made less useful at a later date. So the first being morbs, they produce uh, polluted oxygen, which can be refined and turned into clean oxygen. And they basically are a free source of oxygen and you can farm them quite effectively. There's ways to do it. So we're going to ignore those, uh, even though they are an option because I, I, uh, for the reason stated. The second is steam turbines. I do use steam turbines for cooling, but not as, uh, there are multiple ways you can use these to generate free power or enormous amounts of power for very little effort. And I'm going to avoid all of those simply because it, it basically undermines the intent of the game and means you're 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 missing out on all the gameplay. It's it's like cheating to, to not enjoy the mechanics they've put in front of us. So there's a few things like that. Even door pumps, uh, I wouldn't even classify them as an exploit, but they're basically a free way of moving things around and I'm trying to avoid things that could potentially be removed. So back to the beginning and the choices we made to start. Firstly, I, I don't like to rebuild anything. Every time you have to come back and redo something, you're wasting time. And the more time you waste, the more likely to are, you are to run out of a critical resource before you get to perfect sustainability. Once you have perfect sustainability, take a thousand cycles, redo your base, make it pretty, do whatever you want. That, that's perfectly fine. So what I like to do is design my base, my initial starting base, so that I have to do the least amount of renovations necessary. This, for example, is toilet room here. I, I think I cut this out at about cycle six and it hasn't, the shape of the room has not changed since. Piping's gone in, toilets have moved around a bit, but by and large, but the actual room itself has not actually changed in shape. There's been no massive renovations to the, any of the shapes of any of these rooms. Now, when it comes to building these, there are so many choices. You can look out there, there's uh, square bases, symmetrical bases, elongated bases, tower bases, squat bases, there's, there's so many. Just pick one that works for you. The only thing I will say is make sure where you cook your food, where you store your food, where you eat your food, where you dispose of your food and where you sleep are all really close together. Make sure they're all really close. This cuts down on the scheduling problems. It, it means you can assign less, assign less downtime to them so that you can get more work out of your duplicates. I'll sometimes see people and they'll have their, their, their food source over here in a, a chlorine area to keep it perfectly safe. Well, that means after your duplicates go to the bathroom, they're gonna to have to run all the way to the chlorine area and then run all the way back to your uh, eating area. So don't do that. Keep them all nice and close together and whatever design you pick after that should be fairly safe. Oh, yeah. Next up, electrolyzer setup. Now, as we covered, basically run it off polluted water, run that polluted water through a water sieve and you're good to go. And there is so much polluted water in the slime biome. Now it does require you to cut around smartly to make sure you don't release too much slime lung. It's one of the game mechanics you have to work around and it's, yeah, it's reasonably entertaining and it makes it an actual, it adds to the fun of the game in my opinion. But the main point is, do not put your electrolyzer setup in the cold biome. The, the reason being, if you put it in the cold biome, you're cooling the whole setup, which seems great, but you're also cooling the hydrogen. That hydrogen only exists to be burned pretty much instantly. There's no point cooling hydrogen, which has 
rather high heat capacity. There's no point wasting your cooling on that. We want this setup to last as long as possible before we have to tear it down. And if you'll notice in this, uh, this is actually a perfect example. This is a rather small ice biome. I, I didn't exactly find a lot of weasel warts in here or a lot, and the abyssalite was broken on two sides. So it had already bled out a lot of the chill. And yet still, this has lasted me 450 cycles roughly. Now it's melted quite a bit, but the only thing I'm pumping through here is oxygen. So it has lasted me a lot longer than it would have if I had have actually put the electrolyzer set up in here. Uh, the temperature, of course, over here is absolutely scalding, but my oxygen is still coming out at, uh, what's it, one degree. Secondly, don't try using this for cooling anything else. This should be just locked off and used entirely for your oxygen. Don't try to put water through here to cool it or anything like that. You do that, you're going to melt the whole thing and 100 cycles after you set it up, you're going to have to rip out your electrolyzer setup and move it somewhere else, wasting time that you shouldn't, wasting time and resources. After you get to infinite sustainability, this is, yeah, fine, I will rip this out and I'll move it somewhere else and set up a more permanent cooling solution. Now, that said, bear in mind, this is from the point of view of map resistance. If you were to say happen to find a, a rather large coal biome or one with a, an anti-entropy nullifier in it, take advantage of them by all means. I would definitely move my electrolyzer setup in here, immediately hook it up to the anti-entropy nullifier, set up a little bit of automation, and that would be a permanent setup. So every time I speak declaratively about something, just try and bear that in mind. It's assuming worst case scenario. If you do find some extra resources or uh, bonuses on the map that you can take advantage of, by all means do so. Uh, cut some corners, take a few shortcuts. If it gets you to the end goal faster, that's exactly what you want. Next up, probably the most controversial choice would be the hatchet farms. I was running four hatch farms, roughly 24 stone hatches. That is a lot of, that's a lot of a huge resource investment. It takes two duplicates the whole day just to groom those those stone hatches. So it's a massive, massive investment. Now, I considered it valuable because it actually has so many benefits that are all not immediately obvious. The first one people think about is, of course, obviously coal. And coal is, yeah, fine, we can supplement our coal supply, but that's not just the only benefit. Firstly, yeah, there's igneous rock everywhere. I've got, how much igneous rock have I got left? 1.6, 1,600 tons. I've been running four hatch farms almost since the start of the game. I've used so much. I've used about 1,000 tons of the stuff as insulation in places you're not going to run out of igneous rock, so you're guaranteed that you can set this up. It's a safe bet. Firstly, if you do end up running short on coal, this is a perfect supplement. It makes means that you will never have a coal problem. Uh, then it also gives you omelettes, which is a water-free food source. And because it's a water-free food source, once you've got it up and running, at that point, the only water you're spending or the only, uh, the only clean water from your starting area you're spending is on toilets and sinks, about 10 kilos per duplicate per cycle which is minuscule. It should make sure that your early starting water should last an awful lot longer. You don't have to mess around with using uh, aqua tuners, uh, dumping that heat into polluted water and then sieving the polluted water. It makes things so much simpler. All any extra infrastructure you have to put in or build or maintain, that's just more work and more time when you could be progressing further along and getting towards that, that point of sustainability we're trying to achieve. So water-free food source and additionally, it also gives a morale bonus of plus four, which will come important later. Uh, fried mushrooms give a morale bonus of plus one. I'll, I'll cover a bit on fried mushrooms. They actually do have a place. Now, so I'll, I'll cover a little bit more on these in a bit, but first I want to mention exosuits. Now, exosuits are incredibly powerful. Basically, once your duplicates put them on, the only thing that can kill them at that point is swimming in magma, swimming in volcano, volcanoes and getting hit by multiple meteorites. That's about the only things that can kill them. Oh, and locking them off somewhere where they can't get back, of course. But barring that, they're effectively indestructible. Now, the developers are not stupid. Oh, and they also give a plus 10 to digging. Now, the developers lock these behind a couple of things to, to make sure you can't get them too soon. And we try and rush them. So the two things you need to rush are, one is reed fiber which is contained in a slime biome. So they want to force you to interact with a slime biome, learn its mechanics and learn how to navigate it correctly. Now I've showed you that you can dig around, get into certain areas and usually with minimal slime interaction, get your hands on some reed fiber. However, once you've got your hands on reed fiber, you also need to get their morale up because the second thing they did was they limited the speed of them. 
you get a minus six to athletics, which is basically minus 60% to their movement speed, uh, uh, well, base movement speed. If you get exosuit engineer, it ca cancels out that uh, negative, making the exosuits far more viable. It also gives you plus two athletics, so a 20% bonus to movement speed, making this really powerful. However, you need 20 morale. If you don't have plus 20 morale on the duplicates who are trained as exosuit engineers or training, then your duplicates are going to get stressed out and you're going to need massage tables, stuff like that. And even then, you're, you're basically going to be wasting a lot of duplicate time. So you really need to get that plus 20 morale. This forces you to engage a few other mechanics, namely the rooms. You get up your basic rooms, create all plus six morale, plum toilets plus two, and a regular barracks plus one. That gives us nine morale base. Duplicants have plus one morale to start, bringing us up to 10. We increase the downtime to three slots pretty early on. So that gives us an extra plus two morale. For every point of downtime you have above one, it increases their morale by one. I think all the way up to, I think it's four morale? Yeah, up to four. Anything above that doesn't count. But we're gonna put in an extra point in here. That brings us up to an extra plus two. That gives us 12 morale. Then combined with that, we're running on omelets. That's an extra plus four. That brings us up to 16. That means we only need four more morale points. And the way we get that is decor. The uh, plants and the statues basically bring us up to just about enough. It'll get us there and it's fairly safe to get. Now, fried mushrooms are another alternative food source you can use. However, they give slightly lower morale, which means if you do use fried mushrooms, you're, you're going to have to put in more decor. It'll take a little bit more decor effort, but it can be done. And it's a quite viable strategy, especially if you have lots of coal around, then the hatches become less valuable at that point, And it might actually be in your best interest to switch to fried mushrooms. Traditionally, I would run both. I would run the hatches and the fried mushrooms. Uh, I would support 12 duplicates, 10 on omelets and the remainder on the fried mushrooms. And those, the ones on the fried mushrooms would be internal duplicates, uh, dogs, bodies, uh, ranchers, that kind of thing. That allows you to basically maximize everything. But we're coming at this from the lens of as safe as possible and as map resistant as possible. Now, because we're running a, a water-free food source and our water consumption is so minor, I'm avoiding recycling toilet water. You can recycle the water out of your sinks and your toilets, put it through a sieve, and you'll get polluted, well, clean water back out, germ, germy clean water, and you can pump that right back into your toilets and sinks. It has no negative consequences as of yet, as of the current patch. However, there's the potential for that to be removed later, so I, I try to avoid it just to, just to ensure that it's safe gameplay. Uh, as well as that, the water sieve outputs water at 40 degrees. And if we look over here, it's getting pretty hot over here. Even, with, even 40 degrees doesn't sound like a lot, but water contains an enormous amount of potential heat energy. So that 10 degrees above 30 is an enormous problem. Even with insulated piping, you're gonna start generating heat in here. You're gonna to have to dump in some sort of cooling solution, or you're going to have to put in extra infrastructure at least to, to stop that from happening. Now, if you look here, you'll notice I, I've only insulated, insulated this side of the base because the cool oxygen coming in was actually providing more than sufficient cooling to keep everything going. I left this side open just so I could get some heat in there. I actually ran into cooling problem. I, I was getting freezing to death at points. So. This just allows us to minimize the amount of effort we have to put into infrastructure to get us to the next leg of the game. And that's that's the general goal. Move fast, move quick, get to sustainability as quickly as possible. Next up, once you get exosuits, the reason we want them so quickly is to get oil, but also it's because of the, the bonus speed to digging. It allows us to expand faster. So one of the things that allows us to do is we literally just seal in our base. If you'll notice here, this base is sort of sealed in all around here. Okay, it cracks into the ice boom over there, but that's sealed all around the outside and I have not actually expanded outside this. The initial starting temperate zone, I basically stay inside it, use that as the main base. And then all my expansion outside of that is done via the exosuits. This means I don't have to worry about gases getting in, anything like that. It's just, I don't even bother with a liquid lock. I just put in a front door. So long as my room is pressurized, it should prevent any nasty gases getting in. I think, yeah, we got a little bit of a, we got a little bit of hydrogen made it in. Uh, I can live with that. Now, where do you put your exosuit dock? That is actually quite simple. It's the opposite side to wherever your electrolyzer setup is. Because our electrolyzer setup is going through an ice biome, there's a good chance that ice biome is going to be near the edge of the map. Um, we want to go down and we also want to go out. But if we 
we can't go out and up over here because we will be cutting through our own ice biome and basically hamstringing our own oxygen setup. So what you want to do is opposite side of your base and down pretty low, put in your exosuit dock. The reason we want it down low is because that's going to feed into our industrial brick. And the closer it is, the less travel time, the more efficient it is. The industrial brick, by the way, it can go under your base or it can go to the left of your base. It, it really doesn't matter. It just depends which side is more convenient. Uh, as well as that, the reason we go at the other side is we want to find more ice biomes. We've already explored this side, and if there was any ice biomes, we could see we probably would have raided them for wheezewarts. They're very valuable. So by going at the opposite side, we increase our chances of finding more wheezewarts. The only thing I can't really minimize the chances of are not finding a cold biome. You pretty much need to find one, otherwise you'll never be able to get an electrolyzer set up, up, up and running. You need it for that cooling. So that's one thing that RNG is pretty much going to determine whether you live or die on that. If you find a coal biome, great. If you don't, you're probably in a lot of trouble. But map generation has been pretty friendly. Usually you will get one. Uh, next up, a polluted water tank. This is not an absolute necessity, but I like to put in a polluted water tank, core out a few slime biomes. Once you're in exosuits, it's, it's trivial, and collect all the polluted water. That polluted water is then piped over to the electrolyzer setup. This makes sure I have a giant tank of oxygen basically ready to go constantly and I don't have to worry about oxygen. If you want to play more fast and loose, you can actually go around to, as your water, polluted water starts to run out in the different pockets, you can go around and put pumps in them and move it as needs be. And that would probably be a faster way of doing things. It's just, uh, I prefer to get things consolidated and done. Uh, this clean water tank didn't go in until much later. You're going to live off your main water tank because that provides most of it, most of your uh, most of your necessary water for quite a long time. Next up, industrial brick. Now, the moment you crack oil, this should be the first thing you're planning on building. Like the moment you get down to the oil biome, the only reason we're going there is so we can build this because we want to start refining metals and we want to refine a lot of it. Refined metals are the gatekeeper to all of self-sustainability. If you want to do... Uh, if you want to harness say, a steam geyser, you're going to need diamond, which is available only in the oil biome. And you're also going to need a gold amalgam pump. And you're probably going to need a steel door if you want to do a thermal injector to control the cooling property. Without a steel door, your ability to cool correctly is going to be much more limited. And you're going to be doing a more ghetto setup that's going to be much more difficult to maintain. This allows you perfect controllability and can really allow you to be accurate. Uh, as well as that, you need steel for so many things and ceramic for so many things. And the reason I recommend this uh, an industrial brick design like this is all the heat producers in my base are here, all of them. The only things that produce heat outside of this are, well, let's see, these basic coal generators here that are powering my base and all they're powering is a few auto feeders, auto sweepers, um, research, and the grill. And the grill is probably the one that's run the most in that entire time. That's it. That's why the cooling in here has been so easy to do. There's no high energy producers or high energy consumers in here. Uh, exosuit, stock only, exosuit docks only consume 120 watts when you put them on or off. That's it. It's about the same cost as running a, a mechanized airlock. It's, it's minuscule. This allows you to keep a very, very low heat profile here by dumping them all in here. Everything that produces heat is here. Refined metals, granulators, kilns, uh, the oil refinery that's actually been ripped out, but we'll cover that in another tutorial. Uh, plastic. I effectively ran this plastic machine. I only turned it off recently. I just turned it on and left it running for an eternity. And that's all thanks to having everything in one box with its own dedicated cooling solution. We put in one cooling solution here. It cools our power supply, metal refinement, ceramic production, and oil refinement and plastic. And we can also do glass as well all from one device. So we made one cooling solution and solved all our cooling problems, including, including the power generators themselves. In fact, the polluted water these have been spitting out has been icy cold, and that's been dumped over in our polluted water tank, which got a bit chilly. In fact, if I was smart, I would have put the, the output over here so it would chill the whole tank. This would definitely help spread the cooling. So build, come up with your own industrial design, steal mine or modify mine or modify someone else's. Whatever you do, this is just essential. If I could only give you one tip, it would be come up with a good industrial design, make sure it maintains its own heat, has its own cooling solution, and then you can just churn out and swim in the refined metals. I'm swimming in 
lots of refined metals and that's how we get to a safe sustainable late game uh, one last note and that's about plastic uh, a lot of people want to use dreco farms because drecos can, can give you plastic in a heat-free manner drecos unfortunately they have the longest life cycle of all the critters in the game 150 cycles hatches have 100 they're the second longest so this means this is this age is also reflected in their reproduction rates which means they produce far less eggs they're the weakest critter food source you can possibly use so the only benefit you're getting out of them assuming you set them up with meal wood get them in a hydrogen environment for the majority of their life cycle and all that is you get plastic a very poor source of food and some phosphorite phosphorite you can get it from the wild you can mine it it's not a big bonus they're not nearly as valuable as hatches hatches far better food source far better everything and assuming you make a decent industrial brick insulate it all the way around the edges put in a cooling solution you can run a plastic press for eternity i've never had to turn this off and it's made out of steel so it's got a massive overheat temperature a good setup like this is effectively invaluable i can't really stress it enough it, just to really hammer home how important refined metals are this is my electrical grid it is made out of most of this is all conductive wire lots and lots and lots of conductive wire all across the place you'll notice in my home base i haven't actually replaced it with conductive wire even though i have the materials to do so simply because it works there's no point actually digging anything up but everywhere else you'll see i'm running conductive wire huge distances because you have that capacity so long as you have a decent industrial brick you can churn out so much of it it's not a problem and the ability to do that makes expansion and makes expansion faster easier and just simpler in general as well as that uh, this say this hot water vent here or this yeah the steam vent the water coming out of this is about 95 to 96 degrees so i'm running that through ceramic piping because i can afford to do so even though this is only going to be used intermittently i have ceramic piping running a stupid distance simply because i can afford to do it and this allows me to minimize heat problems things like that the options it gives you to have lots of ceramics lots of metals lots of refined metals gives you the capacity to expand quickly efficiently and more importantly permanently and by that i mean this setup here is permanent it never needs to be touched it never needs to be maintained this will just simply keep turning out steam whenever this vent turns on whenever this uh, geyser comes back cool steam vent kicks back in again after its next period of dormancy we have loads of bank chill ready to go and we will just turn it straight into water which will get dumped into the tank i never need to touch this again the more things you can build where you build it once it's done problem solved the better off you are i usually hold off on tapping cool steam vents and some of the other uh, geyser types until I've got the materials necessary to make sure it's a permanent solution that I never need to touch again. That is most one of the most useful things you can do. That said, you could of course say cover the top of this in metal tiles, dump a bunch of polluted water from a slime biome on top of here and ghetto cool it at the start if you really wanted to. Though what you're going to do with 70 to 80 degree clean water I mean you can use it it's just it's an awful lot of effort for something you can usually ignore and then permanently solve at a later date uh, at which point you'll have the ceramics and the materials necessary to handle all that material without dumping a bunch of heat into an area you don't want it going for example up here we have several wheezworts that i just have not found a use for uh, not so much they haven't found a use for i could definitely have found uses for these actually uh, more case if i excluded them just because the same way I excluded this anti-entropy nullifier, I didn't want to contaminate the playthrough with things that made it, things that were, that you can't potentially get, that may, if you get a bad playthrough, might not show up in your playthrough. All of this is just designed to get you to this point of sustainability, which we are just coming up on. I think, yeah, I just turned on this petroleum boiler a while ago. It's only up to about 6 kgs. It, once this is uh, gone for a bit longer, we'll have up to 10 kgs a second. Um, I'll cover all of this. I'll cover the petroleum boiler and a few other bits and bobs in the next few tutorials. But I just wanted to get you thinking in terms of your end game. What's the actual goal? Now, maybe your goal isn't perfect sustainability. Maybe you have other things you'd like to do. Maybe run 100 duplicates for a thousand cycles. So, uh, there's lots of choices. But all of this tutorial has been focused towards getting towards perfect sustainability. At that point, you can relax. You can take your time, design, redesign, rip things down, and just play around with the entire toolkit they've given us to play with here. Uh, I, I quite enjoy this game just for the sheer amount of options they give you. 
And one thing I, I one of the suggestions I would uh, give you is think about it for a moment. You've seen how I got to this point. Ask yourself, if I had found a say a natural gas geyser in my starting area, how would that have helped me cut corners? How would I have gotten here any faster? Would it have been more efficient for me? Natural gas is one of those things a lot of people push on newer players, and I really would hesitate against fo telling people to focus on it. You get into natural gas, it gets you no closer to refined metals and ceramics. It gives you a cheap source of power, and it helps you know, minimize your coal usage, but minimizing your coal usage doesn't get you to late game. You could have three or four natural gas geysers. Won't help you. It will not help you get to refined metals. you your best bet is you will then be ghetto cooling your refineries using polluted water or something along those lines. For my, mm, uh, con my conjecture on my part, but I believe the developers intend for you to tap oil. The sheer quantity of it, it is, I think there's about 1,500 tons of crude oil on average on every map. The sheer quantity of it implies that the, de the developers want you to use that for cooling, for power, for everything. And they have definitely made it difficult to use. You have to master several mechanics to use it efficiently but once mastered it has multiple benefits far more benefits than just about anything else my advice would be treat natural gas like uh, an, an additional power supply a, a bonus one one that you're supposed it's meant to be you got a little bit of natural gas out of your oil refinery then that you could use that to generate a little bit of bonus power you get a little bit of natural gas out of your fertilizer plants you could use that to generate a little bonus power it was meant to be a bonus uh, a cherry on top something you could get extra it was not intended to be the main power source of the game uh, i do believe petroleum was the one they were pushing to use and it does really work once you get the hang of the mechanics and the rather complicated piping yep there'll, there'll be a full tutorial on that one um once you get the hang of all those mechanics it has so many rewards you will not understand how you you got so far without using it so anyway uh plenty of things to look forward to here there's at least another two or three episodes left in this and uh try out some of these designs give them a go maybe maybe you disagree with some of my points maybe you think uh there's more efficient ways of doing things or getting to that late game stage if there are totally try it out um Maybe you think you could tweak things a little bit better and make them more efficient. I guarantee you, you can. This is not perfectly optimized. I learn something new every game. Uh, oh, and one last note. The, uh, the hatch farms, uh, I'm thinking next playthrough, I'll probably go with two incubators instead of one. The one incubator, it's just a little bit finicky and it took a little bit more effort than I'd like. I think I'll go with two incubators next time. Just something to bear in mind if you still haven't got to this stage yet in the game. Maybe two incubators, and if I do, I might put in a separate power supply for them. And I'm digressing again. Apologies. Oh, yeah. Uh, Enjoy your playthroughs. Have a lot of fun.